Welcome, everyone. This is the 30th of October, 2023. It's the Jenkins Governance Board meeting. So today's agenda includes upcoming calendar and news action items. Ah, then community activity and two governance topic, three governance topics. Any other items that need to be added to the agenda? Yeah, this looks good. All right. So in terms of upcoming calendar, uh, two a little bit more than two weeks from now, we'll have a new LTS 2.426.1 without prototype JS, without support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, and with showing a an end-of-life admin monitor for Java 11 users, getting ready for one year from now when Java 11 will end support in the Jenkins project. We've also got an upcoming weekly tomorrow that has two changes proposed for backport into 426.1. And now there's a, a third Basel. I think the remoting change is also for 381, 3181 is destined for this one. So that's one that may be a third candidate. And we've got officer. Well, there's, um, there's there's the 3161, I think, and 3181, mm -hmm. which I think there was some confusion about um, about uh, how recent how recent we want to go in the back port. But I don't, I don't see a, a particular need to be more recent than the particular issue that uh, was fixed. So there's no there's no there's no desire to get the latest version of remoting backported. Uh, just a desire to fix the bug that was being encountered. Um, Got it. Okay, so thirty-one sixty-one. Then I'll double check that as release lead. I'll double check. Yeah, it, that, but I that, think that means thirty-one sixty-one is the good one, and that's the one I proposed for the backport. Yeah, what you proposed, eight. I already reviewed and approved as being sufficient to fix the bug, while also not including any risky refactorings. So that that was that that looked fine to me, and I already approved that uh, backporting PR. All right, thank you. Okay, so let me make a note to myself to remind me that the remoting backport already included is the desired version. Great, thank you, thanks very much. All right, then in terms of officer and board elections, that's the major event. So we're, we have closed the nomination of candidates and voter registration continues through November 5th. So any, any observations there, comments there? So there was, a, there was a mention on the mailing list from Alexander that the nominations, there's an exact count of nominees to roles. And so we may not need an election. That's how we've done it in the past and said, we're not going to put a ballot out when there are exactly, when the only thing you can vote for is exactly the candidates who are already there. That's not great, but I guess we should have submitted more nominations to them. Right, right. And we, uh, we yeah. certainly sent reminders for nominations in many places and the nominees we got are the nominees we got. So onward to action items then. So the, the board elections are running. We did have, we have 57 registered voters. That's down a little bit from last year where I think we reached 65 or 70. Uh, nominations have now closed. Um, and that's all that I have on that one. Any questions on the election process? I did go around soliciting people to register to vote. Uh, so I think we've done as much as we can to encourage people to, uh, go to the voting page and either register to vote or submit a nomination, et cetera. Yeah, me too. I had, I had sent two or three or four invitations targeted at various people, the Google summer of code past contributors, uh, Google season of docs, past contributors, she code Africa contributors, all sorts of different, different people. And, I, I was a little dismayed that it's easy to register to vote. And yet I think my success rate was only maybe 30%. So, uh, you know, three out of 10 
we're typically registering. Well, I got an interesting. I got an interesting response from one individual who said that they didn't feel like they were in the loop enough to register to vote, but they were actually an active plugin maintainer that participated in the prototype removal project. So, you know, in my mind, that's pretty qualified. I think, you know, you'd be hard pressed to be more qualified than that. But I wonder if there's a gap in perception between um, people feeling that they're not qualified to register versus the reality being that they are. I wonder if there's something we can do to, to increase their confidence that uh, that they really do have a voice. Yeah, I, I I like that observation. I'd call it imposter syndrome as a voter and where it's failure to understand that you know an awful lot about an awful lot of things and you would be a, a real benefit to have your vote. My my technique, and, and maybe it's maybe it's badly chosen, but my technique was to send people a specific message saying, I need you to vote for me. And hoping that they would choose, oh, because Mark Waite asked me to vote for him, that they would choose to register. And again, even that 30% was all. So I thought, oh, I'm being a little manipulative. And still, I only got 30% response rate. I, I did not try to sway people one way or another. I just simply pointed out that they should register. <laughs> right, exactly. So you you weren't the shameless self-promoter that I was. That's yeah. All right, so th that I any oh go ahead, Oleg. Uh, just to double check, uh, do we have any officer positions contested? Because uh, if not, uh, maybe the number of voters isn't that relevant. I, I think it it actually is not relevant because we have no mm -hmm. officer positions contested, and we have no yeah. board election board positions contested. It's just for me, I was worried that if we didn't get registered voters and we needed to have a vote we wouldn't have a, a fair representation. No, it was good that we solicited the voters because the timeline was such that if we did need to do a vote, the deadline to register was coming up very soon. So right. if we if we were starting now, that would be too late. Good, yep. Anything else on, on the elections for 2023? Okay, next topic then is I've still got this action item and no progress on it on combining sub projects and SIGs into a single concept of working groups. Did have a conversation with people at CDF where they're using SIGs as a pretty common term, but whatever term we use, there still needs to be a combining. It's two things right now that aren't effectively any different for each other. So we need that. Retire the Chinese Jenkins site, Kevin. How, what's your experience there? Uh, so I've been able to check in with the Infra team and uh, Damien Deportal actually said that he'd be able to sit down and uh, look at this with me, go over things um, and actually just uh, help me understand what's going on so that uh, it's not just the Infra team doing the work and having it done, but so that I can actually speak to it. Um, we just haven't had a chance to sit down and go over things yet. So um, I'm going to partner with him to take a look at that and get that sorted out. Um, but yeah, just uh, need to set up a time to do that. And then uh, the idea is that once we have that meeting, I can go and uh, then walk Mark through it as well and, and explain how this is all set up for him, uh, sort of for the knowledge share. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm going to take that deadline off of it, Kevin. I think the crucial thing here is we want it done well enough that it works. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. All right, then I had the action item to draft a proposal for to the board for licensing policy and phrasing changes. What we had is we've got some licensing exceptions right now in the things that we're delivering, like JSON, the JSON license is public domain. And for OSI, public domain is not strictly open source. And, and so we've got some, some open questions like that I had a conversation with representatives at the Linux Foundation Member Summit last week, and I think I've got good guidance on how to go forward. Basel guided last time to say, hey, let's look at other projects that are using mix, license mixtures like PyPy and see if we can use some of theirs, and then we'll invoke the help from the Linux Foundation legal team to review the proposal for is it sane, is it sensible, et cetera. Any questions on any of those? 
uh, what's is this something that I could help with if we're trying to get this done within the next uh, couple of weeks? Or is this something that we're comfortable letting it sit on the back burner and I should continue focusing on other things? Because I could I could try to work on this if we want to try to wrap this up soon. But I also don't want to uh, spend a lot of time if if it's not that high on the priority list. And for me, it's not that high on the priority list. I don't think that it's it's a threat to the project when the when the Linux Foundation Summit had a presentation about legal threats to open source projects, and this was not one of the items on their list. So, given that, I thought I think it's it's okay if we rather keep our focus on the higher priority, more 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 user valuable things. So we're not worried about the initial basis for this conversation was someone posting on a developer list about some plugins that were bundling the uh, JSON jar file inside of them. And uh, that, that would normally be something that we take urgent action on uh, to, to uh, for example, stop distributing uh, plugins that violate our hosting conditions, et cetera. But this didn't seem like one of those cases to me uh, because most of the examples that we found, or at least the vast majority of them were already, had already upgraded to the latest version of that JSON library, which is in fact licensed uh, appropriately compared to the earlier versions. Was that, am I, am I remembering that correctly? Close. It's it's at least the current versions are pub declare themselves public oh. domain. Oh, I see. Not declaring themselves MIT or Apache, but then OSI says, "Oh, public domain is not an approved OSI license." Right, but so, so the point I'm making is, yeah, there might be some ambiguity about whether we currently accept public domain in the Jenkins project or not. But that's still a lot better than using right. the outdated version of the library, which in which case it wasn't even public domain. And I think I think the vast majority of usages are using the new version. So I, I'm not concerned about this. It's a high priority. I, now, if, if some prominent Jenkins plugin was still shipping with the non-public domain version of this library, then that might be a more pressing issue for me. But that 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 isn't the case. Good. All right. Any other concerns on the licensing policy topic? Okay, the next topic is in terms of on community activity, we've got this ongoing discussion about the Java support plan. And I've opened up a Jenkins enhancement proposal, which has now been through enough reviews that it's ready to have a JEP number assigned to it and be marked as draft. You're welcome to, to review that further. Uh, it's basically moving to a two years supported, two years required, two years no longer supported model in the six year life cycle of a Java LTS release. Any the only, question? Oh, the ahead. only thing that I wanted to start, uh, the only thing I wanted to discuss in this meeting was where should we, where do we want to document the, cause we're, we're kind of evolving toward this process of um, either using automation or a very well-defined process for doing these migrations, right? Because they're gonna happen more often. Um, and there's a set of steps that need to happen every time, many of which are now automated, uh, such as this, the administrative monitor being automated, but there still are some manual steps that need to be done. Um, and that includes, you know, I just discovered one the other day, like updating the Windows MSI installer. Uh, that's one that we always seem to forget um, because it's at the back of, a lot of our minds, um, but uh, I've been accumulating some of these steps in a big block comment in Jenkins core, um, at least the steps for adding a new Java version. Mm -hmm. But I think we should also document uh, the steps for um, the other two, the other two uh, events in this timeline, which are not just adding a new version, but making it the recommended version. In other words, um, the default in the Docker images, that's another discrete event in time that needs action, um, where there's no automation. And a third event in time is uh, dropping support for the old version. 
Um, and, and again, most of that has been automated. Um, for example, um, you know, the, the administrative monitor will, um, well, has the end of life date baked into it from the day that it's added. So that, that part is automated, but there's some other actions that need to be taken, like updating the POM to require that new version in the compiler settings and things like that. So, um, and, and I, I don't think we need to make a concerted effort to envision every single action, but um, I do think we should have one place where we try to document this stuff so that, uh, over time, we can automate more and more of it. And also so that over time, uh, future release leads or or or, uh, or contributors that want to work on this can just go to that document and, and know exactly what they need to do without having to figure it out from scratch every single time. So I don't know if you want to use that block comment in Jenkins core in the Java doc, or if you want to have some other, if you want to use the JEP or... I'm just, yeah, I, I don't really care where we put this material as long as we decide on where we're going to put it. So that's what I wanted to talk about in this meeting was like, where do we want to document all of this and how do we want to maintain that documentation? I've been, I've been quite pleased with the concept of a release checklist that we use for the, for the Jenkins LTS releases, because it gives us a GitHub backed version controlled document that we then instantiate every time when we're ready to to do it would that be okay for you basel because for me i would love to have a checklist that says making the java version the recommended version don't forget msi don't forget docker containers don't forget this so then do we want um okay that's fine do we want one checklist that covers an entire java version in all three of the stages that i described or do we want three checklists for each Java version, one for the addition of the new version, one for making that the recommended version, and then one for um, removing support for it. I've preferred, I've preferred the shorter lifespan of one for add, one for mandate, and one for drop. But I'm open to others. For me, I like it when I it makes me, it, it gives me a warm feeling when I get to close that issue that says this LTS is done. And if we put all three into one, I wouldn't get that warm feeling until six years or four years later. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the only, yeah, the only downside is that um, just, we just have more objects to instantiate every time right. we want to run through one of these checks, but that's, that's not a very big problem. So, um, well, what I can do if, as part of, I'm working on this blog post and a bunch of other uh, communication related items. So I, what I can do as part of that is move the instructions that I wrote from that Java doc comment and in core into a checklist. And you said you want, you said you think the release repository would be a good place to host that. It, it, it's it, whatever repository put it, we put it in needs to have J GitHub issues enabled. And so yeah. for me, the release repository is a better choice than Jenkins core because I don't want to enable GitHub issues on Jenkins core. Right, right. Okay, that's that sounds good. I I'll move the I'll move the checklist that I started working on from that block comment into uh, the release repository. Um, but that, like I said, that's only one of the three checklists. So uh, as we as we perform these actions for the next in the next few months. Um, I'll, I'll at least make placeholder checklists for the other two events and try to sketch out what I think should happen, but we won't know for sure every single item that needs to go in those other checklists until we start actually doing it. Um, so um, we can only anticipate so much, but I think, um, yeah, I can already see, I can already foresee some issues with um, uh, dropping uh, with, with 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 dropping support for Java 11 in a year because that that creates uh, some challenges with uh, plugin builds that are still trying to support multiple core versions at the same time. So, uh, you know, we 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 came up with uh, one solution for dropping Java 8 support, um, which was not not an ideal one, um, but which was I think the best that we could do. I think we could maybe do better with. Java 11 support, since it is possible just to toggle a setting and plug in 
palms uh, and get you know the right behavior. But we've never actually done this before. So we'll, we'll have to discover how this really works when we actually do it a year from now. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, I mean, you know, I, ideally this would be part of the JEP, I think, but I, I wouldn't insist on it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's something that, that we will, that we will need to do in, in the future. So, I mean, at least in theory, the JEPs are supposed to be descriptions of something that's already been implemented. Um, and this is part of that implementation is removing support for the old version, um, which I don't think has really been either, either actually either done post Java eight or or documented in the JEP. But I, it's not a blocker for me. We could always add the we could always add this later when we actually do it. Yeah, I, I like I like the idea of. The, the, the documentation about JEP specifically say that they can be revised and that they should be revised. So I think putting a link in them in the in that JEP to here's the here's the beginnings of the release of the checklist for Java beginning of life. Here's the uh, the checklist for Java becomes the mandatory and here's the one for Java end of support. Yeah, I like that. And uh, for me, it's it's a reminder that Java 8's end of life is actually not that far away either. Okay, it's further away than Java 11, but there the day is going to come when Java 8 stops stops being supported by the Java vendors as well. Yeah, because due to the fact that uh, the POM changes for Java 11 were so drastic, we couldn't support um, Java 8 and Java 11 from the same plugin POM, which we, we theoretically could with 11 and, and with, with, with nine and up because it's only two properties that are different. So you you could have you could have a, a plug in palm that required Java 17, but which still was used by a plugin that required an older version of Jenkins that still supported Java 11. The only thing you would have to do is set two properties, the compiler target and the test compiler target. Um, now, whether that's something that we actually want plugins to do or not is a separate question because we, we like like I said we could do what we did with Java 8 and just make a flag day in the in the plugin palm and force everyone to do that migration at the same time as upgrading the plugin palm and that has some pros and cons but and the the other approach that I just suggested also has pros and cons so in theory this should be part of the jep discussion is having the the debate between these kinds of uh, engineering trade-offs. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, right now we're talking about Maven 3 and Maven 5 is about being much more flexible uh, with regards to release and profile management. So maybe this won't be even a question anymore soon. Uh, yeah, I agree that uh, Java, well, uh, what I've seen Java 8 we could have supported it with Maven 5, but yeah, as of now, there is no point in that. And should be there such uh, some drastic changes in the future, I think that uh, we would be migrating to Maven 5 at that point anyway. I've been uh, following the Maven developer list and um, it seems like they, it seems like they have been um, making a lot of uh, changes for um the upcoming version of the upcoming next major version of Maven, but all, all of them seem to be compatible um, in the sense of um, you know, the, these migrations that they do in the Maven project take like five years to, to get through. You know, we, we think that yeah. our migrations are long if they take one year or two years, but they have a very broad time scale. But yeah, like you said, oh, like it seems like Maven five, which is like next plus, uh, plus one or next next that one seems like it's going to have a lot of um breaking changes in the sense of uh they're they're reducing the visibility of a lot of public apis um and i, I actually do worry about what that means for things like our test harness because we are relying on some of these um apis being mm -hmm. uh opened up but in any case we, we won't need to deal with that until like six years from now or something. So it's it's quite far away into the future. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, well, if there is a need, we could migrate earlier. Uh, but yeah, as long as we can do this existing Maven without uh, Java 8, I think we should be just fine for now. Great. All right. So anything else on the Java 11, 17, and 21 topic? Okay, next topic then is just to announce that Hacktoberfest ends in one more day. And John Mark Mason has sent messages to the dev list. We're about 30% less than we were last year in terms of contributions. But for me, we also see dramatically less spam. So a, a net positive, actually. Yeah, because uh, there is no physical tissues. Uh, right. So we see the same in other projects. Uh, so if you see 30, 50% drop, it's okay. Good. Excellent. So other topics. So we've talked about the board and officer elections topic already. And I think that one is, is final resolute, final announcement coming from Alex and oops, final announcement. Alex and Uli, and that will come. I've got one topic here that needs board discussion. This is the, we've got a $40,000 Azure credits donation from Microsoft. Very, very grateful. It's been sent to the board as a question, but I wanted to discuss it here in this meeting. So what Damien is asking is, hey, hey, we've got a current Azure subscription type that allows CDF to pay their bills by invoices but we can't use credits to pay the bill. So the current subscription type won't allow us to accept this donation. We want this donation very much because it's five plus months of our infrastructure bill in Microsoft. So Damien asked the board, give me your advice on which of these three paths you would you think I should take in terms of getting this, this donation best absorbed into Jenkins with the least risk to the project. So the choices are change subscription type twice, once to use the credits and once to go back to the old style. Okay, that's first alternative. Second alternative is change the subscription type once and then persuade CDF to switch to pay the bill with a credit card. Then the third path is use an entirely different subscription to host a portion of our workload and keep the existing workloads on the, the, the thing that CDF knows how to pay. So the, the strengths and weaknesses, if we do the convert forward and backwards, Olivier Vernon has warned Damien that the last time he made this change, he spent months getting it adapted to the CDF payment processes and the Microsoft processes. So the worry was if we make this switch, it may take us multiple months to do it. The, the other alternative, attach a CDF credit card would be fine if CDF's willing to do that. But that means we've got to coordinate with them to make the switch and have them now pay with a credit card instead of invoices. And then the third path is just create a new subscription that does our ephemeral workloads, our Kubernetes based and start a new virtual machine and tear it down based and use that. That one though requires a valid payment system for the new subscription. And so we'd have to find somebody who's willing to put their credit card on the line for the for these ephemeral workloads that will be backed fully by the Microsoft donation while we're using it. Questions, comments, concerns, preferences. Oh, and Damien prefers option three. Yeah, option three seems like the lowest risk option to me. No objections. Okay, well, and that was my my take was I like the low risk because manipulating these these accounts and subscription types is well, I've learned by painful experience with the Oracle Cloud thing just how difficult it is sometimes for these cloud vendors to adjust their payment processes or for us to adjust our payment processes. All right, so I I think Oleg, given that your comment and Basel's both say. Let's go with option three, Damien's recommendation. 
I'm going to go ahead and reply to the to the message from Damien that that's the three the the those of us in this meeting said yes, mm -hmm. and then let Uli and Alex and Kosuke if they want to reply differently, let them reply differently in the mail mail thread. Mm -hmm. Great. So for the for the CD, if we have all the payments logistics uh, sorted for now. Yes. Though I guess in one year you might have this question again, but for now, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The 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 payment, for instance, I am proud to state that the September Azure bill has already been paid by CDF. Yes. Yes. Victory. Congrats. Yes. I mean, so no is no disruption to the payments to by CDF to Microsoft for and and I'm proud to announce that Damien that the infra team kept our costs under I think it was just under seven thousand that month so very very nice savings we they, we budgeted ten and they they took us to we were well under eight great all right anything else on that topic. Okay, last topic is just a summary of Oracle Cloud costs. Oracle Cloud still hasn't made their invoice have anything other than a zero dollars due. And I can't yet find a way to justify why CloudBees should pay an invoice that has zero dollars due. So I'm, I'm still waiting for them. Any other topics for today? All right. Is this something so. like uh, is this a case where um, like with GitHub, we we uh, we had that event a few months back where we I wanted them to absolutely confirm that the trust and safety issue was resolved before we move on. So this is something similar where we're just waiting for them to confirm. Exactly. They the 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 choices here are they either need to tell us yes we found a way so that the invoices are non-zero amounts so that they could be paid, or they tell us they're donating the equivalent, the, the, those those costs to the Jenkins project, so it's done. And yes, yeah. it's it's blocked on that. And I regularly ping them about every two weeks saying, hey, it's been two weeks. Have you changed, the, has this thing become visible? And their answer is, oh no, but can you figure out a way to pay it even though it's not visible to you? And my answer back is, I'm sorry, my finance people don't like paying invoices that have zero dollars due. They don't know what to do with that. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks everybody. Recording will be available in about 24 hours. Thank you very much.